Pletho's exposition of the more obscure passages in these oracles. Seek thou the way of the soul, whence or by what order, having served the body to the same order from which thou didst flow. Thou mayest rise up again, joining action to sacred speech. The magi that are followers of Zoroaster, as also many others, hold that the human soul is immortal and descended from above to serve the mortal body, that is, to operate therein for a certain time and to animate and adorn it to her power, and then returns to the place from which she came. And whereas there are many mansions there for the soul, one wholly bright, another wholly dark, others betwixt both, partly bright and partly dark. The soul being descended from that which is wholly bright into the body, if she perform her office well, runs back into the same place, but if not well, she retires into worse mansions, according to the things which she hath done in life. The oracle, therefore, saith, Seek thou the soul's path, or the way by which the soul flowed into thee, or by what course, namely of life, having performed thy charge toward the body, thou mayest mount up to the same place from which thou didst flow down namely, the same track of the soul, joining action to sacred speech. By sacred speech, he understands that which concerns divine worship. By action, divine rites. The oracle, therefore, saith that this exaltation of the soul, both speech concerning divine worship, prayers, and religious rites, sacrifice, are requisite. Next fragment. Stoop not down, for a precipice lies below on the earth, drawing through the ladder which hath seven steps, beneath which is the throne of necessity. He calls the descension into wickedness and misery a precipice, the terrestrial and mortal's body, the earth, for by the earth he understands mortal nature, as by the fire, frequently the divine. By the place with seven ways, he means fate, dependent on the planets, beneath which there is seated a certain dire and unalterable necessity. The oracle therefore adviseth that thou stoop not down toward the mortal body, which, being subject only to the fate which proceeds from the planets, may be reckoned among those things which are at our arbitrament. For thou wilt be unhappy if thou stoop down wholly to the body, and unfortunate, and continually failing of thy desires, in regard of the necessity which is annexed to the body. Next Fragment for thy vessel the beasts of the earth shall inhabit. The vessel of thy soul, that is, this mortal body, shall be inhabited by worms and other vile creatures. Next fragment. Enlarge not thou thy destiny. Endeavor not to increase thy fate, or to do more than is given thee in charge, for thou wilt not be able. Next fragment. For nothing proceeds from the paternal principality imperfect. For from the paternal power, which is that of the supreme God, nothing proceedeth imperfect so as thou thyself mightest complete it. For all things proceeding from thence are perfect, as appears, in that they tend to the perfection of the universe. Next fragment. But the paternal mind accepts not her will until she go out of oblivion and pronounce a word, inserting the remembrance of the pure paternal symbol. The paternal mind, 
namely the second god and ready maker of the soul, admits not her will or desire until she come out of the oblivion which she contracted by connection with the body. And until she speak a certain word, or conceive in her thoughts a certain speech, calling to remembrance the paternal divine symbol or watchword, is the pursuit of the good which the soul, calling to remembrance, hereby becomes most acceptable to her maker. Next Fragment It behooves thee to hasten to the light and to the beams of the Father, from whence there was sent to thee a soul endued with much mind. The light and splendor of the Father is that mention of the soul, which is circumlucid, from whence the soul arrayed with much of mind was sent hither, wherefore we must hasten to return to the same light. Next Fragment These the earth bewails, even to their children. Those who hasten not to the light from which their soul was sent to them, the earth or mortal nature bewails, for that they being sent hither to adorn her, not only not adorn her, but also blemish themselves by living wickedly. Moreover, the wickedness of the parents is transmitted to the children, uncorrupted by them through ill education. Next Fragment The ungirders of the soul, which give her breathing, are easy to be loosed. The reasons which expel the soul from wickedness and give her breathing are easy to be untied and the oblivion which keeps them in is easily put off. Next Fragment In the side of the sinister bed there is a fountain of virtue which remains entire within, not emitting her virginity. In the left side of thy bed there is the power or fountain of virtue, residing wholly within, and never casting off her virginity, or nature void of passion. For there is always in us the power of virtue without passion, which cannot be put off, although her energy or activity may be interrupted. He saith the power of virtue is placed on the left side, because her activity is seated on the right. By the bed is meant the seat of the soul, subject to her several habits. Next Fragment The soul of man will, in a manner, clasp God to herself. Having nothing mortal, she is wholly inebriated from God, for she boasts harmony in which the mortal body consists. The human soul will, in a manner, clasp God and join him strictly to herself, who is her continual defense, by resembling him as much as she can possibly. Having nothing mortal within her, she is wholly drenched in divinity, or replenished with divine goods. For though she is fettered to this mortal body, yet she glories in the harmony or union in which the mortal body exists. That is, she is not ashamed of it, but thinks well of herself for it, as being a cause, and affording to the universe that, as mortals are united with immortals in man, so the universe is adorned with one harmony. Next Fragment Because the soul, being a bright fire by the power of the Father, remains immortal, and is mistress of life, and possesseth many completions of the cavities of the world. The second God, who first before all other things proceeded from the Father and Supreme God, these oracles call all along the power of the Father, and his intellectual power, and the paternal mind. 
He saith, therefore, that the soul procreated by this power of the Father is a bright fire, that is, a divine and intellectual essence, and persisteth immortal through the divinity of its essence, and is mistress of life, namely, of herself, possessing life which cannot be taken away from her. For how can we be said to be masters of such things as may be taken from us, seeing the use of them is only allowed to us? But of those things which cannot be taken from us, we are absolutely masters. The soul, according to her own eternity, possesseth many rooms in the receptacles of the world, or diverse places in the world, which, according as she hath led her life past, is allotted to every one. Next fragment. Seek paradise. Namely, the circumlucid mansion of the soul. Next fragment. Defile not the spirit, nor deepen a superficial thing. The followers of Pythagoras and Plato conceived the soul to be a substance, not wholly separate from all body, not wholly inseparate, but partly separate and partly inseparate. Separable potentially, but ever inseparate actually. For they assert three kinds of forms. One wholly separate from matter, the supercelestial intelligences. Another wholly inseparable from matter, having a substance not subsistent by itself, but dependent on matter, together with which matter, which is sometimes dissolved by reason of its nature subject to mutation, this kind of soul is dissolved also, and perisheth. This kind they hold to be wholly irrational. Betwixt these they place a middle kind, the rational soul, differing from the super-celestial intelligences, for that it always coexists with matter, and from the irrational kind, for that is not dependent on matter, but on the contrary, matter is dependent on it, and it hath a proper substance potentially subsistent by itself. It is also indivisible, as well as the super-celestial intelligences, and performing some works in some matter, allied to theirs, being itself also busied in the knowledge and contemplation of beings, even unto the supreme God, and for this reason is incorruptible. This kind of soul is always coexistent with an ethereal body as its vehiculum, which she by continual approximation maketh also immortal. Neither is her vehiculum inanimate in itself, but it is self-animated with the other species of the soul, the irrational, which the wise call the image of the rational soul, adorned with fantasy and sense, which seeth and hears itself whole through whole, and is furnished with all the senses and with all the rest of the irrational faculties of the soul. Thus, by the principal faculty of this body, fantasy, the rational soul, is continuously joined to such a body, and by such a body sometimes the humane soul is joined with a mortal body, by a certain affinity of nature, the whole being infolded in the whole enlivening spirit of the embryon, this vehiculum itself being of the nature of a spirit. The daimon souls differ not much from the humane, only they are more noble and use more noble vehicles. Moreover, they cannot be mingled with corruptible nature. Likewise, the souls of the stars are much better than the daimons, and use better vehicles. Our bodies are splendid by reason of the greatness of the operative faculty. These doctrines concerning the soul of the Magi, followers of Zoroaster, seem to have used long before. Defile not this kind of spirit of the soul, saith the oracle, nor deepen it being a superficial thing. He calls it superficial, not as if it had become a triple dimension, for it is a body, but to signify its extraordinary rarity, nor to make it become gross by accession of more matter to its bulk. For this spirit of the soul becomes gross if it declines too much toward the mortal body. 
Next fragment. There is a room for the image also in the circumlucid place. He calls the image of the soul that part which, being itself void of the irrational, is joined to the rational part, and depends upon the vehicle thereof. Now he saith that this kind of image hath a part in the circumlucid region, for the soul never layeth down the vehicle adherent to her. Next fragment. Leave not the dross of matter on a precipice. He calls the mortal body the dross of matter, and exhorteth that we neglect it, not being ill-affected, but take care of it while it is in this life, to preserve it in health as much as possible, and that it may be pure, and in all things else correspond with the soul. Next fragment. Carry not forth, lest going forth she have something. Carry not forth, meaning the soul, out of the mortal body, lest by going forth thou incur some danger, implying as much as to carry her forth beyond the laws of nature. Next fragment. If thou extend the fiery mind to the work of piety, thou shalt preserve the flexible body. Extending up thy divine mind to the exercise of piety, or to religious rites, and thou shalt preserve the mortal body more sound by performing these rites. Next fragment. Certainly out of the cavities of the earth spring terrestrial dogs, which show no true sign to mortal man. Sometimes to many initiated persons there appear, whilst they are sacrificing, some apparitions in the shape of dogs and several other figures. Now the oracle saith that these issue out of the receptacles of the earth, that is, out of the terrestrial and mortal body, and the irrational passions planted in it, which are not yet sufficiently adorned with the reason. These are apparitions of the passions of the soul in performing divine rites, mere appearances having no substance, and therefore not signifying anything true. Next fragment. Nature persuadeth that daimons are pure, the burgeons even of ill matter are profitable and good. Nature or natural reason persuadeth that daimons are sacred, and that all things proceeding from God who is in himself good are beneficial, and the very bloomings of ill matter or the forms dependent upon matter are such. Also he calls matter ill not as to its substance, for how can the substance be bad, the bloomings whereof are beneficial and good? but for that it is ranked last among the substance, and is the least participant of good, which littleness of good is here expressed by the word ill. Now the oracle means that if the bloomings of ill matter, namely of the last substance, are good, much more are the daimones such, who are in excellent rank as partaking of rational nature, and being not mixed with mortal nature. Next fragment. The Furies are Stranglers of Men. The Furies, or the vindictive daimones, clasp men close, or restrain and drive them from vice and excite them to virtue. Next fragment. Let the immortal depth of the soul be predominant but all thy eyes extend quite upward. Let the divine depth of thy soul govern, and lift thou all thy eyes, or all thy knowing faculties, upward. Next fragment. O man, 
the machine of boldest nature. He calls man the machine of boldest nature because he attempts great things. Next fragment. If thou speak often to me, thou shalt see absolutely that which is spoken, for there neither appears the celestial concave bulk, nor do the stars shine, the light of the moon is covered, the earth stands not still, but all things appear thunder. The oracle speaks as from God to an initiated person. If thou often speak to me or call me, thou shalt see that which thou speakest, namely, me whom thou callest everywhere. For then thou shalt perceive nothing but thunder all about, fire gliding up and down all over the world. Next fragment. Call not on the self-conspicuous image of nature. Seek not to behold the self-seeing image of nature, namely the nature of God, which is not visible to our eyes. But those things which appear to initiated persons, as thunder, lightning, and all else whatsoever, are only the symbols or signs, not the nature of God. Next fragment. Every way to the unfashioned soul stretch out the reins of fire. Draw unto thyself every way the reins of fire which appear to thee when thou art sacrificing with a sincere soul, namely a simple soul and not one of various habits. Next fragment. When thou seest a sacred flame without form, shining flashingly through the depths of the world, hear the voice of fire. When thou beholdest the divine fire void of figure, brightly gliding up and down the world, and graciously smiling, listen to this voice as bringing a most perfect presence. Next fragment. The paternal mind hath implanted symbols in souls. The paternal mind, namely the sedulous maker of the substance of the soul, hath engraft symbols or the images of intelligibles in souls, by which every soul possesseth in herself the reasons of beings. Next fragment. Learn the intelligible, for as much as it exists beyond thy mind. Learn the intelligible because it exists beyond thy mind, namely, actually, for, though the images of the intellectual things are planted in thee by the maker of all, yet they are but potentially in thy soul. But it behooves thee to have actually the knowledge of the intelligible. Next fragment. There is a certain intelligible which it behooves thee to comprehend with the flower of thy mind. The supreme God, who is perfectly one, is not conceived after the same manner as other things, but by the flower of mind, that is, the supreme and singular part of our understanding. Next fragment. For the Father perfected all things and delivered them over to the second mind, which the nations of men Call the first. The Father perfected all things, namely, the intelligible species, for they are absolute and perfect, and delivered them over to the second God next to him to rule and guide them. Whence, if anything be brought forth by this God, and formed after the likeness of him, and the other intelligible substance, it proceeds from the Supreme Father. This other god men esteem the first, that is, they who think him the maker of the world, to whom there is none superior. Next fragment. Intelligent yingis do themselves and also understand from the father, 
by unspeakable counsels being moved so as to understand. He calls yingis the intellectual species which are conceived by the father, they themselves also being conceptive and exciting conceptions or notions by unspeakable or unutterable counsels. By motion here is understood intellection, not transition, but simply the habitude to notions, so as unspeakable counsels is as much as unmoved, for speaking consists in motion. The meaning is this, that these species are immovable and have a habitude to notions not transiently as the soul. Next fragment. Oh, how the world hath intellectual guides inflexible. The most excellent of the intelligible species, and of those which are brought down by the immortals in this heaven, he calls the intellectual guides of the world. The Corypheus of whom he conceives to be a god, which is the second form of the father. The oracle saying that the world hath inflexible guides means that it is incorruptible. Next fragment. The father hath snatched away himself, neither hath he shut up his own fire in his intellectual power. The father made himself exempt from all others, not including himself, neither his own intellectual power, not in the second god who is next to him, or lighting his own fire, his own divinity, for it is absolutely ungenerate, and itself existing by itself, so that his divinity is exempt from all others. Neither is it communicable to any other, although it be loved of all, that he communicates not himself, is not out of envy, but only by reason of the impossibility of the thing. Last Fragment The Father infuseth not fear, but persuasion. The Father makes an impression of fear, but infuseth persuasion or love, for he being extremely good, is not the cause of ill to any, so as to be dreadful, but is the cause of all good to all, whence he is loved of all. These oracles of Zoroaster, many eminent persons have confirmed by following the like opinions, especially the Pythagoreans and the Platonists. Psalos his Exposition of the Oracles Fragment 1 There is a room for the image, also in the circumlucid place. With the philosophers are those things which are co-natural to things more excellent than themselves, and are worse than they, as the mind is co-natural to God, and the rational soul to the mind, and nature to the rational soul, and the body to nature, and matter to the body. The image of God is the mind, of the mind, the rational soul, of the rational soul, the irrational soul, of the irrational soul, nature, of nature, the body, of the body, matter. Here the Chaldaic oracle calleth the rational soul the image of the rational, for it is co-natural to it in man, and yet worse than it. It saith moreover that there is a part assigned to the image in the circumlucid region, that is to say the irrational soul, which is the image of the rational soul being purified by virtues in this life. After the dissolution of the human life, it ascends to the place above the moon, and receives its lot in the circumlucid place, that is, which shineth on every side, and is splendid throughout. For the place beneath the moon is circumnebulous, that is, dark on every side, but the lunary, partly lucid and partly dark, that is, half bright, the other half dark, but the place above the moon is circumlucid or bright throughout. 
Now the oracle saith, The circumlucid place is not designed only for the rational soul, but for its image also, or the irrational soul is destined to the circumlucid place, when, as it cometh out of the body bright and pure, for the Grecian doctrine asserting the irrational soul to be immortal, also exalts it up to the elements under the moon. But the Chaldaic oracle, it being pure and unanimous with the rational soul, seats it in this circumlucid region above the moon. These are the doctrines of the Chaldeans. Fragment 2 Leave not the dregs of matter on a precipice. By dregs of matter, the oracle understands the body of man consisting in four elements. It speaks to the disciple by way of instruction and exhortation thus, Not only raise up thy soul to God, and procure that it may rise above the confusion of life, but if it be possible, leave not the body wherewith thou art clothed, and which is dregs of matter, that is, a thing neglected and rejected, the sport of matter, in the inferior world. For this place, the oracle calls, a precipice, our soul being darted down hither from heaven, as from a sublime place. It exhorteth, therefore, that we refine the body, which he understands by the dregs of matter, by divine fire, or that, being stripped, we raise it up to the ether, or that we be exalted by God to a place immaterial and incorporeal, or corporeal, but ethereal or celestial, which Elias the Thisbite attained, and before him Enoch, being translated from this life into a more divine condition, not leaving the dregs of matter or their body in a precipice. The precipice is, as we said, the terrestrial region. Fragment 3 Bring not forth, lest going forth, she have something. This oracle is recited by Plotinus in his book of the Education of the Irrational Soul. It is an excellent and transcendent exhortation. It adviseth that a man busy not himself about the going forth of the soul, nor take care of how it shall go out of the body, but remit the business of its dissolution to the course of nature. For anxiety and worry about the solution of the body and the education of the soul out of it draws away the soul from better cogitations and busieth it in such cares that the soul cannot be perfectly purified. For if death come upon us at such a time as we are busied about in this dissolution, the soul goeth forth not quite free, but retaining something of a passionate life. Passion, the Chaldean defines, as a man's solicitous thinking of death. For we ought not to think about anything but the more excellent illuminations. Neither concerning these ought we to be solicitous, but resigning ourselves to the angelical and diviner powers which raise us up, and shedding up all the organs of sense in the body and in the soul also, without distractive cares and solicitudes, we must follow God, who calls us. Some interpret this oracle more simply. Bring it not out, lest it go forth, having something. That is, anticipate not thy natural death, although thou be wholly given up to philosophy, for as thou hast not a complete expiation, so that if the soul pass out of the body by that way of educting, it will go forth retaining something of mortal life. For if we men are in the body as in a prison, as Plato saith, certainly no man can kill himself, but must expect till God shall send a necessity. Final Fragment Subject not to thy mind the vast measures of the earth, for the plant of truth is not upon the earth, nor measure the measures of the sun, gathering together cannons. He is moved by the eternal will of the Father, not for thy sake. 
let alone the swift course of the moon, she runs ever by the impulse of necessity. The progression of the stars was not brought forth for thy sake. The ethereal, broad-footed flight of birds is not voracious, and the dissection of entrails and victims, all these are toys. The support of gainful cheats. Fly thou those, if thou intend to open the sacred paradise of piety, where virtue, wisdom, and equity are assembled. The Chaldean withdraws the disciple from all Grecian wisdom, and teacheth him to adhere only to God. Subject not, saith he, to thy mind the vast measure of earth, for the plant of truth is not upon earth. That is, inquire not solicitously the vast measures of the earth, as geographers used to do, measuring the earth. For the seed of truth is not in the earth, nor measure the measures of the sun, gathering together cannons. He is moved by the eternal will of the Father, not for thy sake. That is, busy not thyself about the motion and doctrine of the stars, for they will move not for thy sake, but are perpetually moved according to the will of God. And let alone the swift course of the moon, she runs ever by the impulse of necessity, that is, inquire not anxiously the rolling motion of the moon, for she runs not for thy sake, but is impelled by a greater necessity. The progression of the stars was not brought forth for thy sake, that is, the leaders of the fixed stars and the planets receive not their essence for thy sake. The ethereal, broad-footed flight of birds is not voracious, that is, the art concerning birds flying in the air called augury, observing their flights, notes, and perching, is not true. End of The Chaldaic Oracles of Zoroaster and His Followers with the Expositions of Pletho and Psellus Edited and translated to English by Thomas Stanley London, 1661 Read by Dan Attrell if you've enjoyed this presentation and would like to help support the channel, please visit patreon.com slash themodernhermeticist and become a patron to help support more work such as this. Thank you for listening.